Good afternoon. I'm Mickey Travathi, National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. It's really an honor to welcome you all today as we recognize World Sickle Cell Day on June 19th, 2024. This day serves as a crucial reminder of the ongoing challenges and the importance of our collective efforts to improve the lives of individuals affected by sickle cell disease. As many of you may know, sickle, uh, 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 health equity in general is a top priority for this administration and the Department of Health and Human Services and my office in particular, the National Coordinator um, uh, for Health IT. And in that context, we, you know, we note that sickle cell disease is not just a health condition, it's a health equity priority for, you know, for all of us. The disparities faced by individuals with sickle cell disease are profound and demand our urgent attention and action, which is partly why we're here today. The importance of uh, uh, interoperable, uh, interoperable data systems is critical to our being able to move forward. Um, to address these uh, disparities, we've got to be able to leverage the power of data interoperability across our healthcare delivery and human services system to best serve um, individuals with sickle cell disease. By ensuring that data can seamlessly flow between providers and systems, we can enhance research capabilities and clinical care, ultimately leading to better health outcomes for patients. We have great gratitude for the ONC OASH partnership um, and uh, we're gonna provide a little bit of an overview of the USCDI Plus for Sickle Cell Disease project as well. I'm really thrilled about the partnership that we have between ONC and the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Our collaboration on what we call the USCDI Plus SCD, which is the USCDI Plus for Sickle Cell Disease Minimum Core uh, Dataset Project is a testament to our shared commitment to advancing health equity for um, uh, sickle cell disease patients. The initiative itself aims to develop a standardized interoperable data set that addresses the unique needs of individuals with sickle cell disease. This project will not only standardize data collection and improve care coordination, but also pave the way for more robust patient-centered outcomes research, all based on the standards that we already require um, of electronic health records um, vendors and the providers who use those systems. Um, so being able to say, let's build from that data, that, that uh, those data requirements that are already in place today and add the additional data elements that are needed to support the specific needs of sickle cell disease so that we can have better quality data um, and better ability to share that, um, that information in meaningful ways. Um, our efforts are grounded in, the, in this administration's commitment reaffirmed by Secretary Becerra and Admiral Levine to eliminate health disparities for persons with sickle cell disease. We're dedicated to leveraging data standards and fostering cross-agency collaboration to achieve this goal. As we continue today's webinar, I'm pleased to introduce Lynn Shaw, Counselor for Sickle Cell Disease in the immediate office of the Secretary. Lynn's dedication and expertise have been instrumental in driving forward our sickle cell disease initiatives. Please join me in welcoming Lynn Shaw. Thank you so much, Dr. Chapathi. Uh, in recognition of World Sickle Cell Day, I want to commend the more than 100,000 individuals in the United States and the 20 million people worldwide with sickle cell disease and their families, their caregivers, and their care teams. Sickle cell disease, as many of us today know already, is an incredibly difficult disease. It's characterized by intense and prolonged episodes of pain, organ failure, stroke, among other complications. Sickle cell disease patients and their families must also wrestle with stigma, racial bias, lack of awareness, and a shortage of knowledgeable providers and fragmented care. And despite these challenges, sickle cell disease patient warriors have shown tremendous resiliency, strength, and incredible grit to persevere and fight for themselves and for others, for equitable and higher quality care and for a better quality of life. It is my privilege to be here this afternoon alongside my brilliant and incredibly hardworking and dedicated HHS colleagues who are fighting every day to improve care for patients with sickle cell disease and their families. I especially want to acknowledge Laverne Pearlie at ONC and Dr. David Wong from OASH who organized today's discussion. Dr. Wong is the leader of sickle cell disease work across HHS and Laverne Pearlie is one of the driving forces behind some of the really encouraging sickle cell disease data projects that will be highlighted later today and that Dr. Chapathi just alluded to. Uh, Dr. Chapathi, I just really wanna thank you so much, you and your team for your work on sickle cell disease data 
and improving our ability to share sickle cell disease data across healthcare systems and communities throughout this country. And I just want to say a couple of things about Mickey Tripathi because his resume is very long and I we don't have enough time to really say all the immense things that he's already accomplished and will go on to achieve. But Dr. Tripathi is our national coordinator for health IT and our acting chief AI officer at HHS. He leads the formulation of the federal IT strategy and coordinates federal health IT policy standards, programs, and investments. He has over 20 years of experience in this field and it most recently served as a chief alliance officer for Arcadia, a healthcare data and software company focusing on population health management and value-based care, and has been at the forefront of data interoperability and health information exchange among many other areas. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Dr. Chapathi. Thank you so much for your you and your team's time. Great, thank you. I think I'm turning it now over to Laverne. Is that right? Thank you, Mickey, and thank you, Lynn, and thank you all for joining us in recognition of World Sickle Cell Awareness Day. Federal agencies and external partners collect sickle cell disease-related data for multiple purposes and needs. It is important to involve a wide variety of stakeholders and have their buy-in to ensure efficient data sharing results and improved outcomes for individuals affected by sickle cell disease. Today, the panel will provide insights into diverse sickle cell disease data systems and introduce an emerging initiative to establish a standardized sickle cell disease minimum core data set applicable across federal and non-federal organizations. Our panelists are Captain Karen Abe from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She's the chief of the, of the Blood Disorder Surveillance and Epidemiology Branch, Division of Blood Disorders and Public Health Genomics, National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities. And she will speak to us about the Sickle Cell Disease Data Collection Program. Next is Aurelia Chaudhry, who serves as the sickles, who serves at the Cell and Gene Therapy Access Model co-lead at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS's Innovation Center. And she will discuss with us how integrating data supports this model. Dr. Meghna Alam Chandani is the Deputy Division Director in the Office of Biostatistics and Pharmaco Pharmacovigilance at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration. She will speak to us about post-marketing safety surveillance of sickle cell disease gene therapies. Dr. Jeffrey Brasco is the Director of the Division of Services for Children with Special Health Needs and Maternal and Child Health Bureau at the Health Resources and Services Administration. And he will share with us today the Globe and Regional Data and Discovery, the Granddad Registry, and a newborn screening case study. And from NIH, we have Dr. Julie Pampinto, who serves as the Director of the Division of Blood Diseases and Resources for the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. She will provide us with an overview of NIH sickle cell disease data, cohort clinical trials, data cloud system, and bio repository. And we have my colleague, Liz Torrey, who is the branch chief in the Office of Technology, Standards, Care Coordination, and Collaboration at ONC. And Liz will share with you the new USCDI Plus Minimum Core Dataset Project. If you have any questions for our panelists, we ask that you will submit them through the Q&A box and include your name and your organization. Captain Abe. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to share about CDC's Sickle Cell Data Collection Program. Next slide. So the Sickle Cell Data Collection, or SCDC, program is a public health surveillance system. We work with states to collect health information to study long-term trends in diagnosis, treatment, and health care access for people living with sickle cell disease. The SCDC program is unique in that, one, it is comprehensive. The system links multiple data sources, and as you can see in the diagram, 
sources such as newborn screening data, hospital discharge, Medicaid, emergency department data, birth and death, and clinic data linked all together to identify everyone, the whole population with sickle cell disease within a participating state. Second, it's longitudinal, following individual patients over time across healthcare systems. And finally, it is dynamic. New years of data are linked and new data sources can also be added. For example, during COVID-19, one state was able to access and link their SCDC data with their state's COVID registry. Next slide. Currently, there are 16 states participating in the program, representing approximately 50% of the U.S. sickle cell disease population. Next slide. SCD, SCDC priorities start with comprehensive data collection, but it does not end there. While CDC collects aggregate demographic and healthcare utilization data, each state ultimately determines its own data use to inform state-level changes. States have multidisciplinary teams that include healthcare providers, researchers, community-based organizations, people living with sickle cell disease and or their caregivers, and public health practitioners. This type of engagement allows the data to fully inform the current need within the state. That information is communicated and disseminated widely to partners and or state policymakers for public health decision making. Next slide. How does this data to action look like? In California, SCDC data was used to identify the geographic location, healthcare utilization, and demographics of over 8,000 Californians living with sickle cell disease. They identified people living with sickle cell disease in specific counties that did not see an experienced sickle cell disease provider. And this information was shared with state policymakers to support legislative action to direct resources to establish 12 SCD clinics in geographic areas with the greatest burden. Next slide. In Georgia, SCDC data showed that almost 25% of newborns with sickle cell disease born in Georgia live more than an hour drive from a specialty clinic with daily service. As a, resort, as a result, Georgia is establishing additional care models such as strategically placed um, sickle cell disease clinics, telehealth services, and mobile health units. Next slide. And finally, this is an example of how states can work together. Early and consistent pediatric preventive services are critical to improve the health and quality of life for children with sickle cell disease. An analysis with SCDC data found that across five states, Medicaid ensures more than 80% of newborns for at least one month in their first three years of life. This showcases the significant role Medicaid plays as a primary health care insurance provider and the opportunity for SCDC programs to work with their state Medicaid agency with potential for wider discussions to ensure early care initiation and implementation of recommended preventative services. Next slide. In summary, CDC's SCDC program is established, one, to support the infrastructure for a surveillance system that collects data to inform healthcare practice and policies related to sickle cell disease. Two, to gain a better understanding of the healthcare and the health outcomes of all individuals with sickle cell disease, regardless of age, insurance, disease severity, or location of healthcare. And three, to disseminate the data to help inform policy and healthcare standards that improve and extend the lives of people with sickle cell disease. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, hi, I'm Aurelia Chaudhary, and I'll speak a little bit about um, the Cell and Gene Therapy Access Model at the CMS Innovation Center. I'm so excited to be joining this group again. I had the privilege of attending the Data Roundtable a year ago when we were at the outset of working on our model. I'm so grateful for all the contributions that everyone uh, here around the table and in the audience has made in, in helping us think about the use of data in our model. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background about the Innovation Center and about our model, and then I'll focus on the data systems that we plan to in bring together and how we might interact with broader efforts happening at HHS. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Congress created the Innovation Center as part of the Affordable Care Act to attest models or new approaches for paying for and delivering healthcare services. 
The purpose of the Innovation Center is to test care delivery and payment models that are expected to reduce program expenditures and preserve or enhance the quality of care for beneficiaries. One of those models is the cell and gene therapy access model. Um, this is a voluntary model for states and manufacturers that would test whether a CMS-led approach to developing and administering outcomes-based agreements for cell and gene therapies could improve Medicaid beneficiaries' access to treatment, their health outcomes, and could reduce healthcare costs and burdens to state Medicaid programs. The first condition that the cell and gene therapy access model will be focusing on is sickle cell disease, which is why I'm here today. Um, and the vision of the model is that CMS would negotiate with the manufacturers of gene therapies for sickle cell disease a set of key terms for uh, a broad outcomes-based agreement. And then state Medicaid agencies would decide whether to sign on to that set of key terms or not. And CMS would provide support through technical assistance and funding to participating states, including supporting the data collection and reconciliation activities associated with determining whether the outcomes uh, of, of interest in the cell and gene therapies um, have been met or not met. When we announced the model earlier at the beginning of this year, we put out a timeline of what we would envision would happen over the course of 2024. In that timeline, we imagined that we would release a manufacturer request for applications in March of this year, spend the summer engaged in negotiations with manufacturers, um, release a state request for applications, a state notice of funding opportunity this summer, um, and then towards the end of this year, potentially conclude the negotiation process and work to get states to, to decide whether to participate or not. Um, with state participation beginning as early as January of 2025. Um, we're happy to say that we're still on track for that timeline. Uh, given the confidentiality of the negotiation process, I can't share too much more about where we are, um, but we're excited here to talk about the data infrastructure parts of the model that we continue to develop in parallel with our other activities. Um, no, there will be no slides, just, just words for me. Um, so focusing on the data strategy, uh, under the vision for the model we've described, the key role for CMS is gathering, aggregating, and analyzing data to determine whether the gene therapies have been having the effect that we would hope they have in this population. So we've been invested in trying to understand how we can pull together the required data systems to make that happen. The kinds of outcomes we're interested in include things like reductions in certain kinds of healthcare utilization, like patients not needing to go to the hospital for basal-occlusive crises or not needing the certain kinds of um, disease-modifying interventions, um, some of which we might be able to capture from claims data, measures like lab values, right? Are we still seeing hemolysis happening? Are we seeing an improvement in the um, share of non-sickling hemoglobin? And patient-reported outcomes, are we seeing patients reporting uh, reductions in pain, improvements in fatigue, improvements in their ability to, to live their lives? Um, and the process of figuring out which outcomes we're going to be tracking, which of those we might have a payment, is going to be balancing act around what manufacturers are willing to contract around, what's feasible to collect and administer, and what measures the outcomes that really matter to patients and to participating states. I'm really fortunate here to learn so much from the people present about the data infrastructure that already exists, including efforts by our friends at CDC, HRSA, and FDA, um, as well as by the patient registries that have been operating this space, including those managed by CIBMTR, um, the Center for International Blood Marrow Transplant Research, um, the National Alliance for Sickle Cell Centers and the American Society for Hematology. Uh, we're actively working on finding ways to partner with these various data systems and to create ways to link external data like patient registry data or patient surveys with claims data so that we can generate a holistic pack picture of what's happening to patients following gene therapy. Um, we're currently in the process of exploring ways to use privacy preserving record linkage tools to help in creating that integrated picture of a patient and we've recently completed the procurement of a vendor to help us do that. Um, we remain very excited about the HHS effort to create a minimum core data set for sickle cell disease, as the use of a core data set that's got consensus across relevant stakeholders will make our efforts in linking together that picture from different sources more fruitful. So we look forward to continuing the conversation and lending our perspective where we would be helpful. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Meghna Alim Chandani. I am from the Center for Biologics at FDA. I work in the group that conducts post-marketing safety surveillance for CBER biologics, including the sickle cell disease gene therapies. Next slide. 
This is my disclaimer statement. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so this was FDA's press release for the December 2023 approvals for Cascavi and Lifgenia, the first gene therapies to be approved for SCD. In the next few slides, I will provide an overview of post-marketing safety monitoring, including passive surveillance and active surveillance for these products. Next slide. So passive surveillance, also referred to as routine pharmacovigilance, allows for continuous safety monitoring for licensed products and refers to spontaneous adverse event reports that are submitted to FDA. Reporting is voluntary for the public. Reporting is mandatory for the manufacturers. The manufacturer has to submit expedited reports for serious and unlabeled adverse events. And under enhanced pharmacovigilance, FDA may have additional requirements for expedited reporting for certain adverse events of special interest. For both Cascavi and Lifgenia, we have routine pharmacovigilance and enhanced pharmacovigilance requirements. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the strengths and limitations of passive surveillance databases. It is important to note that the pharmacovigilance database accepts all reports, regardless of causal association, and that reported diagnoses are not verified. Next slide. Now switching gears to what we mean by active surveillance. With active surveillance, I am referring to post-marketing safety studies. For reference, this is the FDA guidance for long-term follow-up after gene therapies. For both Cascavi and Lifgenia, we have post-marketing requirements for 15-year long-term follow-up safety studies. Um, so in the next few slides, we can go on to the next slide, please. So the next few slides are for publicly posted materials that are available on our web pages, and I'm going to quickly go through them. Here is an excerpt from the Lifgenia label displaying information on hematologic malignancy. Next slide. This is an excerpt from the approval letter showing the requirements for routine pharmacovigilance and enhanced pharmacovigilance for secondary malignancies. Next slide. This slide lists the post-marketing requirement for the long-term follow-up study as described in the approval letter. Next slide. We'll switch gears to Cascavi. Here is an excerpt of the Cascavi label displaying information on off-target genome editing risk. Next slide. This is showing the excerpt from the approval letter regarding the requirements for routine pharmacovigilance as well as enhanced pharmacovigilance for secondary malignancies and off-target effects following genome editing. And uh, we can go through the next two slides. These slides list the PMRs for safety and long-term follow-up as described in the approval letter. Next slide. So in summary, post-marketing surveillance includes many approaches, including passive and active surveillance. FDA may require post-marketing studies to be conducted by manufacturers, as was the case for the SCD gene therapies. Post-market safety monitoring is necessary and mandated by our regulations to ensure the safety and effectiveness of products. That's all I have. Thank you. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, my name is Jeff Brasco. I'm from the Maternal Child Health Bureau at HRSA, and we are proud to be participating in this data panel for World Sickle Cell Day. Next slide, please. So HRSA funds a network of clinical centers. Um, these are university centers, hematologists across the country in five different regions. And the goal of these centers and all of their satellite clinics is to ensure that every person with sickle cell disease has access to high quality health care. So these are clinicians across the country working together to try to improve outcomes for people with sickle cell disease. We also fund um, a complementary set of community-based organizations. There are 25 of them around the country, and they are responsible for trying to address social terms of health and health-related social needs so that people with sickle cell can actually get to these clinics and take the medications that they need and get the care that they need. Next slide, please. Now, our grantees... Um, have put together this, a multi-site clinical registry. So again, these are specialists in sickle cell disease, and they now have 52 approved clinics, sites across the country, and they enroll in people with sickle cell disease with their consent, um, and there are more than 4,000 patients already enrolled. And this provides a real wealth of data on both the clinical and the other health-related outcomes, such as pain and fatigue. 
Um, this information is used to improve the quality of care and outcomes for people with sickle cell disease. And also is a, a dramatic allows for dramatic improvement in clinical research because we can understand exactly what's going on and what's working for people with sickle cell disease. Next slide, please. Separate from that, I'd like to present a quick example of how one state has been able to integrate different data systems at a public health level that also improves outcomes for individual people. Um, this is the Connecticut Newborn Screening Network, and you see two stars where the two main children's hospitals are. That's Connecticut Children's and Yale Children's Hospital. Next slide, please. And the way the system works in this HRSA-funded um, network is you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner the Department of Public Health. This is part of the Connecticut state government. And I think, as you know, pretty much every child in this country is screened for sickle cell disease and 35 other conditions. And any child that's found positive for any of these conditions is then, those information is then shared with the contractor at Connecticut Children's Hospital. And they use the electronic health record EPIC, um, which is used at Connecticut Children's and at Yale. And what happens is they've created an instance of EPIC that allows them to create registries. And not just for sickle cell disease, but also for hypothyroidism, for other conditions that are captured in newborn screening. And they can then use data, um, they can use this instance of EPIC to link to other data sets across the country, across the state, um, including at Yale, but also some primary care clinics that use EPIC, and then use care everywhere to bring in other sorts of information. And as you can see in the top right, they also connect with immunization registries. Next slide, please. For sickle cell in particular, they use the practice guidelines that many of us are familiar with. So they focus on things like transcranial Doppler and hydroxyurea and penicillin, the kinds of things we know that saves lives and improve outcomes. Next slide, please. And then created these registries, as I mentioned before. And here's just a snapshot of what it looks like at the patient level. So if you're a doctor or a nurse practitioner or other healthcare clinician, you can see right away whether this child or that you're seeing, as it is right now for children up to age four, you can see right away what labs they've had, what work they've had done, and what needs to be done, what might be missing. Next slide, please. And then at the clinic level, you can see all of the patients in that particular clinic or all of the children that a clinician is taking care of. And, and the names are blocked out, but it tells you where they are up to date on what they're missing so that you can make sure that you can follow up with any child who's missing out on any of these key care guidelines. Next slide, please. And then at the state level, you can see that the state Department of Health grantee is able to monitor across the entire state how each of these programs are doing. Um, and so the hematology group is in the bottom right-hand corner, but of course, they're looking at all the newborn screening outcomes. Next slide, please. And this is just some data that was recently published by this Connecticut group on the newborn screening network. And what it shows is the how well children are doing with staying up to date with these health guidelines. So getting penicillin, transgenic Doppler, hydroxyurea, and so on. And you can see in the bottom in red is the legacy cohort. And they are somewhere in the range of 50 to 60% of children are getting the services they need. In this newborn screening network that I just described, you see that over the last couple of years, 80 to 90% of children are getting all the services they need. So this is a very clear example of how sharing data across an entire state between public health and clinicians has allowed the system to say, who are the folks that are getting care? Who's missing care? And how do we improve it? It's a good example of how interoperability of data has led to real improvements at the individual level. Next slide, please. If you'd like to learn anything more about it, please let my colleague, Mandy David, or I know about that. Next slide, please. And to learn more about HRSA, here's some more information. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity today to present and share some of our information about sickle cell disease and data. So next slide, please. I plan to discuss two main sources of data uh, for NHLBI sickle cell disease data that are interrelated and also mention two areas we have been involved in to advance use of common data elements in the sickle cell disease field. The first with the sickle cell, Cure Sickle Cell Initiative, and the second with the Phoenix Toolkit, which has supported sickle cell disease measurement. Next slide, please. So the NIH aims to ensure that data that results from research funded by the NIH is made publicly available. So the objective of the sharing of this data is to accelerate the pace of research, enable validation of the results, and um, ensure that data is accessible and of high value. 
So to meet this objective, the NIH has a policy for data management and sharing that investigators have to follow if they're doing NIH-funded research, and essentially uh, it expects three things. The first is that the, there's a plan and a budget for the data, that the plan is submitted for review at the time of their uh, grant application, and then at the time of the award and, and at the end of their award, that they comply with the policy uh, that was outlined at the time of their award. Next slide, please. So in support of this publicly sharing of research data uh, supported by the NHLBI, the NHLBI has a cloud-based ecosystem to post data to. This serves as a resource for the community, both for posting and sharing of their data for the public, but also for researchers to use the data for their own research. This cloud-based system is called Biodata Catalyst or BDC. For investigators who have milestone-driven research, such as our clinical trials, or if they are supported by research from special RFAs or ancillary studies to our uh, NHLBI parent studies, the NHLBI requests or encourages data from this research to be placed into BDC, into the cloud. For other NHLBI-funded research, the data can be posted to any NIH-approved uh, data repository for use by the community. The NIH data sharing plan requests that this be done by the time of publication of the main results or by the end of the award. Next slide, please. So although BDC is a newer cloud-based repository for NHLBI data that's available to the public, the legacy system that was used is called BioLink and it's shown in the figure here. It's been around much longer and has served and still serves as a resource for our community looking for data related to NHLBI funded studies, which include sickle cell disease studies. It is important to note that uh, there's also a biorepository of participant specimens for sharing of biospecimens, if that was part of the funder research. And this links to the data repository uh, of BioLink as illustrated in the figure. So slowly our prior, prior funded sickle cell disease studies that had been posted originally to BioLink are being migrated over to BDC or to the cloud. So the most well-known study would be the cooperative study of sickle cell disease. And then newer sickle cell disease studies are going directly to BDC for cloud sharing and use by the public. Next slide, please. So lastly, I wanted to touch on two common data element concepts that the NHLBI has participated, participated in for sickle cell disease. The first is the Phoenix Toolkit, which su has supported a couple different endeavors focused in sickle cell disease, and it serves as a resource related to measurement protocols. So essentially measurement is done similarly to allow for comparison across studies. One example is if uh, there's a pre-transfusion antibody testing measurement. So if you are looking to measure for antibodies pre-transfusion in your study, there's a measurement recommended uh, for use so that um, that can track red blood cell antibodies. If obviously all studies use this measurement, you could compare across studies, uh, certainly enhancing um, our knowledge across studies. In addition, the Cure Sickle Cell Initiative worked together to identify and recommend common data elements for measurement in the research of genetic therapies in sickle cell disease. This is posted to the NIH Common Data Elements Repository for all to use. An example of what this serves is if you want to measure, for example, pain impact after cell and gene therapy, the initiative identified and recommended use of the adult Ask Me tool uh, in pain impact domain to be used for this outcome. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention. That is all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for um, your presentations. Liz will be next. Good afternoon. Oh. Oh. Good afternoon. Um, so I'll just go ahead and, and talk while the camera switches over. Um, I am pleased to uh, be able to share an update around our new USCDI Plus initiative for sickle cell disease um, led by Laverne Purley. Um, and I am supporting her in that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in order to, before I go into uh, the details around the project, I want to give a little bit of background and history so that we're we're all we all understand where this is coming from. So next slide. 
Um, the USCDI uh, and U USCDI provides the background and backdrop for USCDI Plus. Um, it was a new standard established by the ONC in the 2020 21st Century Cures Act final rule um, and has been updated in our rule released in, um, in December, the HTI-1. Um, it sets the floor and minimum data set required for interoperability. It's all about the data that gets exchanged um, between EHR systems and uh, receiving systems, wherever they may be. Um, so it defines uh, required data elements and vocabulary standards. Um, it's agnostic to format, so it can be used in, in multiple ways. Um, within healthcare IT, um, we, we, see, we do see that in a couple of different ways. Um, and it focuses on patient access and care coordination use cases. We update it on an annual cycle. Um, we are currently reviewing draft V5. Um, so uh, as you can see here, this was uh, V1, which was in 2020 um, and uh, was updated to V3 in uh, HTI1. And now we're, we're working on draft V5. Um, next slide, please. So the, the the great thing about USCDI is that it sets a floor for interoperability in the data that gets exchanged. The downside to UC USCDI is that it does not meet every possible use case or interoperability need. So um, over time, we have learned that there were there were very specific use cases that needed data exchange and needed the focus on it. And so we developed um, USCDI Plus as a service um, that we can provide to you uh, to federal partners and out there in industry to be able to uh, collaborate um, and establish, harmonize, and advance those interoperability needs that go beyond that core data in USCDI. So, um, uh, so to that end, next slide. Um, that brings us to USCDI plus sickle cell disease. So, just kind of as a Again, a little bit of a, some history. Um, last year, we attended the Sickle Cell Disease Data Registry Leaders Roundtable with the American Society of Hematology. Those sessions built upon previous secretarial, secretarial roundtables held in November 2021 and April 2022. Um, and those audience consisted of um, advocates, researchers, providers, and other federal agencies. Um, that roundtable focused on how federal and non-federal partners can leverage SCD data capture to improve data collection, cohesion, data quality, all of the things that we've been talking about so far today, uh, while maximizing federal access to data to avoid redundancy, data burden, uh, and to um, with regards to the response to SED. Um, next slide, please. So at that meeting, um, we shared the current state of SED data collection and challenges. Um, you know, some of those challenges are data collection on SED is not standardized and lacks interoperability across across health systems and federal agency programs. That's why uh, Dr. Brasco's presentation was so um, important because it shows where you can see some interoperability. Um, but in general, it makes it difficult to share and exchange health information for clinical, programmatic, and research purposes. Um, during recent meetings with OASH, um, it was expressed that there's a need for in, an interoperable data exchange to improve access, care, and treatment for persons with SED. Um, Secretary Becerra and Admiral Le Re Levine reaffirmed HHS's commitment to eliminating health disparities for persons with sickle cell disease via data collection and collaboration. And so OASH wants to use those data collected to implement program and policy decisions to help clinicians treat pa patients with SED. Um, so the, the decision was then we agreed on to develop this Core, core data set around US uh, around sickle cell disease to meet those data requirements. Next, next slide, please. So um, in developing um, our project plan, we were able to submit and we were um, awarded a patient center outcomes trust fund um, uh, award. Uh, to build this and strengthen the data capacity for PCOR 
um, and comparative clinical effectiveness research. Um, we fell under their proposal theme of health equity, um, and we were we were able to show that by developing this core data set, um, we align with um, a number of priorities across HHS, around PCOR, around ONC, et cetera, related to data capacity and health equity and improving the capacity to collect, link, and analyze data for PCOR studies. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the overarching goal of this project is, again, to build and strengthen that data uh, infrastructure for PCOR. And um, we are in the process of launching it. And I just want to share, I know that we've, this was really technical, but I also want to share that, you know, part of the way we do this is incorporating voices from perspectives of everywhere that data are collected and data touch um, lives. So that we talked about providers, we talked about researchers, but that also includes the voice of the patient warrior. And I think that we need to like make sure that that's reiterated, that um, it does um, it does mean that we need to incorporate all the voices along the data journey. So um, next slide, please. So from an impact um, perspective, uh, we want to priority, prioritize and modernize the SED data collection, um, implement program and policy decisions to help clinicians treat um, sickle cell disease, improve data quality, care coordination, and collaboration, reduce health disparities with improved data collection, increase opportunities for interoperability between systems for real-world evidence and SED research, maximize federal access to data to avoid redundancy and reduce data burden. Again, I want to reemphasize hearing the voices of all um, points of view across the data journey. And um, in closing, we can address the current challenges by doing this. So we're really excited to be doing this project um, and really excited to share future updates as well. Back to you, Laverne. Thank you, Liz. And as you have um, shared, it is very important to include the warrior voice uh, to help ensure that the data we collect best address the community's needs. And so I've, my question for the panelists today um, is how is the warrior voice incorporated to inform your sickle cell disease uh, data systems? And I'd like to start with um, Dr. Pimpinto with this question. Sure, yes, thanks for that important question. So two different comments in this from the NHLBI. One is that we do collect patient-reported outcome information using um, validated forms. So the example would be the sickle cell disease ask me tool, right? So one of the cohorts involved in um, monitoring our cell and gene therapy, the clinical trials monitoring cell and gene therapy, that's one um, measure that can be used to bring in the patient voice. So the patients are reporting on how they may their life may be impacted by um, treatment, for example. And that's a, a common way. And I think a couple of the speakers um, brought that patient reported outcome measurement tools as a, one way to bring in the patient voice. And that can also be brought into the medical record um, and then be shared. The second is the Cure Sickles Initiative that I mentioned regarding um, developing common data elements. Uh, individuals living with sickle cell disease participated in that initiative and continue to participate in the Cure Sickle Cell Initiative and are part of a community um, input panel uh, that give us input um, on a continuous basis. So two illustrations. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brasco, did you have anything you wanted to add about this? Sure, uh, a couple of things. One is for granddad, and that's the patient registry that I talked about that's at um, um, dozens of clinics across the country. I was speaking with Sophie Lanscron, who's one of the founders of this, and she described in, in great detail the consumer advisory group that's made up of, of warriors and family members and described how their input has been essential to deciding what are the key elements that need to be included. So I think that's a really good example of how from the very beginning, this network, which improves quality and, and helps with research, um, is designed around what people with sickle cell disease think is most important. And just one other comment is regarding the uh, the Connecticut example I gave you, which is more of that public health surveillance approach um, that includes some 
um, voices from particular people, is that the electronic health record they're using allows them to send out questionnaires to individuals that said, you know, things like about quality of life, child development, connection to school concerns, and so on. So there's ways to collect that data that's built into the system. So um, one example I gave you how the, the patient voice is included in all the thinking about it, but then the second example is how we can actually be integrated into the data system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Megna, is there anything you wanted to share? Sorry about that. Um, yes, I mean, the patient's uh, input and the patient's voice is absolutely critical to the FDA's uh, regulatory decision making. And from the post marketing perspective, we are collecting the adverse event reports that are submitted by patients and the public and uh, considering that data very carefully. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And so I'd like to transition and ask uh, questions about um, data partnerships. It's important to have partnerships uh, within your communities. But um, besides the uh, sickle cell disease community, there is another important stakeholder um, for um, end user sickle cell disease data, and that's state Medicaid agencies. And so I'd like to ask um, uh, two questions here. Uh, as panelists, can you share examples of how uh, data outputs and findings from sickle cell disease data systems are shared with state uh, Medicaid agencies? And so that's the first question. And then the second question is, how can data partnerships between the sickle cell disease community and state Medicaid agencies be strengthened? And so I'll ask, um, start with Aurelia with this question. Thanks so much. So one of the core visions for the cell and gene therapy access model is, as I mentioned, to pull together data from a variety of sources, not just for tying it to payment um, with respect to manufacturers, but also for the purposes of understanding what the impact of these potentially transformative therapies are. So, you know, in our hopes for the model, we would imagine tying together data from a range of sources, including claims data, but also data from patient registries, data from patient surveys, pulling together a comprehensive picture and sharing that with the state Medicaid agencies that are participants in our model, such that state Medicaid agencies can both um, see in a broader way what the impact of these therapies are on their beneficiaries, which may illustrate potentially the value of these therapies in a different way. And also so that state Medicaid agencies, I think, begin to see potentially the value of these broader um, visions of their beneficiary population in a way that might set a precedent or create learnings that may be applicable beyond the, the sort of narrow window of, of thinking just about gene therapies for sickle cell disease. Captain Abe, do you have any insights? Sure. You know, I did mention in my slides um, the example where the five states um, showed that Medicaid insured more than 80% of newborns living with sickle cell disease in Georgia, at least one month in the first three years of life. And so this kind of data can be uh, shared with their state Medicaid agencies. Uh, I think many of the multidisciplinary teams do um, interact on a regular basis with their Medicaid agencies. I think it could be strengthened um, by some of the, the data sharing agreements and really looking into, you know, the the legality of what what kind of information can be shared at what level across key partners. Thank you. Are there any others who'd like to respond to this question? Sure, I can I can comment. I think we um, the NIH and NHLBI in particular with CMS have a uh, a working committee that. Uh, work across the federal agencies to help connect. And uh, one example is we have um, connected with the state Medicaid uh, directors and had a webinar for cell and gene therapy. In addition, we have spoken with the um, chief medical officers of the Medicare or regional Medicare groups. So I think those are another example of working kind of behind the scenes where we're trying to provide knowledge of what we know is happening um, on our side with data and connecting the two agencies. Thank you. The Laverne, this, this is Jeff Roscoe. I, just one other example that I know of where you can see the very specific outcomes for, for people with sickle cell, and that's a state Medicaid agency that's working with the children's hospitals in the state, um, as well as the managed care organizations. And like many states, they have a quality improvement program in place in, in which um, the managed care organizations have a 
certain percentage withhold. That is, some of the money is held back, and they only earn it if they meet certain quality metrics. And among the quality metrics is transcranial Doppler for, for people with sickle cell disease. And so among those providers and those hospitals and institutions, they're working really hard to make sure that every person gets the transcranial Doppler at the right time um, in order to earn their quality withhold. And so hearing some of the stories, you hear things like, well, as we looked at it, we realized if we have the ultrasonographer scheduled who can do that kind of transcranial Doppler on the same day that a person's actually coming to the clinic, that would make a huge difference for the family and improve outcomes. So I think it's one example of how when you have the right data in the right place and the right incentives in place, you can actually improve the quality of care for people and just make it a better experience. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions that have come in from the Q&A. Um, let me start with the first one that we received. Uh, it's from Tanika Hoffman, and she is representing the Sickle Cell Coalition of Maryland. And her question, she says, will there be funding to help post-transplant patients navigate social issues after gene therapy, such as support for missing time off from work or school, for example? or those needing long-term mental support? Uh, will the community-based organizations be responsible for walking alongside post-transplant warriors? So I'm, I'm happy to take that question first, although happy for, for others to chime in as well. Um, so, you know, going back to the theme of incorporating the voices of, of patients with sickle cell disease, sickle cell warriors, uh, in the work that we do, um, one important theme that's come out from the work that we've done listening to patient voices has been understanding that the post-transplant journey is a challenging one and one that will require continued care and support along a bunch of different dimensions, including the psychosocial dimensions. Um, that's why uh, as we have drafted the model, we're including as part of the model a notice of funding op opportunity for states, which we plan to issue later this summer, which will support states in coming up with innovative solutions and ways to support the community and ways to support patients, both on the front end and the back end of transformative therapy. So we look forward to being able to share more about that later this summer, but uh, we are we are well aware of the issue and very thankful to some of the voices here. I see some of the beneficiaries and clinicians that we've spoken to on this call um, for, for raising the importance of this issue. Thank you. Um, another question says, how is reproductive health issues in women and girls and other genders captured in the data collection? Uh, this would include pregnancy outcomes, menstrual issues, and hormone therapies. I mean, that information for SCDC, if it's in the administrative data, if it's in clinic data, then we capture it. Another and question. I'm sorry. And I can add a little bit to it. Depends on the study, but for example, the Sickle Cell Disease Implementation Consortium, which has continued on as a natural history data resource uh, as a comparative arm for curative therapies that collects some information. I don't have the details, but uh, there was a publication in 2022, for example, about pregnancy outcomes in women um, taking hydroxyurea. So I know that there is uh, some reproductive health information and there is a, a website that can detail some of those case report forms, but that's just one example of another study collecting some of that data that's relevant. Another question, but, I'm sorry. I was just gonna add that some of this information can also be collected in the post-marketing safety studies as well. Thank you. Um, see, another one that's come in, it's asking, um, can the registry be used to inform local direct service agencies of the number of patients in their area? Can the registry be used to inform uh, direct services, direct service agencies of the number of patients, I guess that's with sickle cell disease in their area? So, so this is um, Jeff Brosco. I can talk a little bit about our community-based organizations. As I said, 
HRSA funds 25 of these uh, across the country. And each of them has different kinds of relationships to data use agreements. So for example, some of them are connected to the state newborn screening program. So as they get information about a newborn baby that has sickle cell, they can reach out to families, connect with them. And their job as a community-based organization is really to address whatever the issues the family may have, whether it's about insurance or transportation or food or housing, and try to connect that family to services. Many of them also have those kinds of data agreements with the local hematology clinic. And so they are connecting with, with patients that way. And I know that all of our, you know, I sort of just showed the, uh, the hematology clinics themselves. We call them the treatment demonstration programs, the TDPs. They also work either with these community-based organizations or with others and so with social work departments. So for all of their, all of their patients, they are thinking about what are the social and political and economic issues that their patients are facing and try to connect them to services. So the, the short answer is yes, but it's not a perfect system across the country. It's a little bit of this works here and that works there. And I would probably follow up and say the same thing as um, Dr. Brasco, that for instance, another example from one of our states um, in Michigan, when they uh, linked all their data sets, they found five times more the number of sickle cell patients that were living in the state. And so um, they were able, they were able then to use that to identify patients that were eligible for care and do it and do a reach out. Uh, someone is asking a question. Uh, they, I've complimented you. They said these are excellent presentations. And uh, they're asking for opportunities uh, to comment and opportunities for a partnership. And the uh, the organizations are H3 Africa, Data Science Initiative Africa, Sickle Cell in Africa, and GGTI, Sickle Cell in Africa. And we will have opportunities in the future for listening sessions. And uh, we will plan those accordingly and uh, share that information via the same mechanism so that you will have an opportunity to provide some input um, in the future as we go along with the program. And my last question uh, uh, for the panelists, it says, how can interoperability help improve access to care, treatment, and coordination of services for persons living with sickle cell disease? And this is panelists and any, any of our other HHS um, speakers that were here today. I can start. I think data, uh, especially data that's linked from uh, care encounters through the electronic health record, especially across systems, can be pretty invaluable for the individual living with sickle cell disease because then that brings knowledge for all of the individuals taking care of them um, without um, the, the hurdles of not having that data available across systems, right? So I think it decreases some fragmentation of care um, and also brings increased knowledge as a population level view, um, trying to un better understand where do individuals live, where do they receive their care, and um, what are their care outcomes, treatment and outcomes. And this is Jeff, I've just add that in some ways it's it's exactly what Liz was describing about um, about their model, right? So you can imagine if as a clinician, you're able to know what's happening with the patients that you're taking care of, but you could also connect sort of horizontally with, directly with families and with social service agencies. But then there was also some vertical integration so that the Medicaid and other payer incentives were lined up with the things that really matter for people with sickle cell disease. And then at, at the highest level, you had sort of be able to survey across the state who's doing well, what programs are working, what aren't. You, you heard today, I think, each of the different pieces of that that are happening in some places. Um, but if you imagine a fully integrated system, that would probably really be the biggest difference. And I think that's what we're working toward. Thank you. Um, we have um, two minutes left, and I'm going to ask for uh, Alicia Richmond to join us with a closing remarks. But I want to thank each and every one of the panelists who presented today uh, for this uh, presentation. And we look forward to uh, coordinating and collaborating with you further. Alicia? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Hi, I'm Alicia Richmond and I'm the Associate Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. <laughs> so I just wanna say thank you. On behalf of Secretary Becerra, Admiral Levine and myself, 
We thank you for participating in this panel for World Sickle Cell Disease Day. Sickle cell is a health equity priority for HHS. And as you heard from today's panelists, there is power in cross-agency collaboration and coordination and aligning health data systems for better care, coverage, treatment, and sickle cell disease research. Mickey, I want to thank you and the ONC team for partnering with us at OASH to work on creating an inoperable minimum data set for sickle cell disease. I'm really excited about this project and I'm eager for our federal and external partners to be involved in this important work. When I first started this piece a year ago um, with Laverne, it was a question of, well, what's needed? What is the data saying? And it was clear at the onset, this is what is needed, this project us having an inoperable minimum data set. And so again, that is why I'm excited about this, um, this partnership. And so to that end, I wanna thank our HHS Optive lead, our um, agency leaders and stakeholders. Um, working collectively, we are better able to make a significant impact to improve the quality of life and well-being of sickle cell disease warriors and advocates. And so for that, for all of you, I say thank you for joining us today and know that there is more to come. Thank you, Alicia. Next slide. So for additional information from ONC, uh, you can contact us uh, via phone, or through our health IT feedback forms. We have the links here. We have a Twitter page, LinkedIn page, and a YouTube page. And for today's presentation, it will be available on the HHS uh, YouTube page. So you can uh, watch the recording. Thank you again for your time.